भगवती उत्तम श्लोके भक्ति भवती नैष्टकी सो वे रीडिंग फ्रॉम द श्रीमद भागवतम कैंटो टेन चैप्टर फिफ्टीन Entitled "The Killing of Dhenuka the Ash Demon," text thirteen. Please repeat after me. Chakora, Krauncha, Chakrava, Bharatvajamscha. बरहीना अनुरावति स्म सत्वानाम भीतवद व्याग्रसिम्हायो चकोरक्रांच चक्रावह भारद्वाजांस्च बरहीना अनुरावति स्म सत्वानाम भीतवद व्याग्रसिम्हायो चकोरक्रांच चक्रावह भारद्वाजांस्च बरहिना अनुरावतीस्म सत्वानाम भीतवद व्याग्रसिम्हायो चक्रांच चक्रावा भारद्वाजांस वाहिना भीतवद व्याग्रसिम हयो चकोर क्रांच चक्रावा भारद्वाजांस च the Chakora, Krauncha, Chakrava, and Bharadwaja birds. Barhina, the peacocks. Anurautisma, he would call out in imitation of. Satvanam, together with the other creatures. Bhitavat, acting as if afraid. Vyagra Simhayo of the tigers and lions. Translation and purport by disciples of His Divine Grace, Shri Aisi Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada. Translation. Sometimes He would cry out in imitation of birds, such as the Chakoras, Kraunchas, Chakravas, Bharadwajas and peacocks. And sometimes He would run away with the smaller animals, in mock fear of lions and tigers. Purport. The word bhitavat, as if afraid, indicates that Lord Krishna played just like an ordinary boy and ran with the smaller forest creatures in mock fear of the lions and tigers. Actually in Vrindavan, the abode of the Lord, the lions and tigers are not violent and thus there is no reason to fear them. Om 
ಅಜ್ಞಾನತಿಮಿರಂದಸ್ಯ ಜ್ಞಾನಂಜನ ಶಲಾಖಯ ಚಕ್ಷುನ್ ಉನ್ಮಿಲಿತ ಯೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುವೇ ನಮಃ ನಮೋ ವಿಷ್ಣುಪದಾಯ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪ್ರಸ್ತಾಯ ಭೂತಲೆ ಶ್ರೀಮತಿ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮೀತಿ ನಾಮಿನಿ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ದೇವಿ ಗೌರವಾಣಿ ಪ್ರಚಾಯ ನಿರ್ವಿಶೇಷ ಶೂನ್ಯವಾದಿ ಪಾಶ್ಚಾತ್ಯ ದೇಶದ ಸೊ ಹಿಯರ್ ವಿ ಸಿ ವೆರಿ ಬ್ಯೂಟಿಫುಲ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕ್ರಿಪ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಹೌ ದಿ ಲಾರ್ಡ್ ಇಸ್ ಸೊ ಮರ್ಸಿಫುಲ್ ಟು ಆಲ್ ಲಿವಿಂಗ್ ಎಂಟಿಟೀಸ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಡಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕ್ರಿಮಿನೇಟ್ ಯು ನೋ ಅಮಂಗ್ ಲೆಟ್ ಅಲೋನ್ ಲಿವಿಂಗ್ ಎಂಟಿಟೀಸ್ ಬಟ್ ಈವನ್ ಅಮಂಗ್ ದಿ ಆನಿಮಲ್ಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಹ್ಯೂಮನ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ಸ್ ಬಟ್ ಈವನ್ ದಿ ಸ್ಮಾಲರ್ ಆನಿಮಲ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಯು ನೋ ದರ್ ಇಸ್ ಸಚ್ ಅ ಲವಿಂಗ್ ರೆಸಿಪ್ರೊಕೇಷನ್ ಆ್ಯಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಟ್ ದಟ್ ಈವನ್ ಇನ್ ಟುಡೇಸ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಯು ನೋ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಈವನ್ ದಿ ವೈಲ್ಡ್ ಆನಿಮಲ್ಸ್ ವಿ ಕಾಲ್ ದಮ್ ವೈಲ್ಡ್ ಆನಿಮಲ್ಸ್ ಬಟ್ ಆ್ಯಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಇಫ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ನಾಟ್ ಹಾರ್ಮ್ಡ್ ಜನರಲಿ ದೇ ಡೋಂಟ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಡು ನಾಟ್ ಪ್ರವೋಕ್ ದೆಮ್ ದೇ ಡೋಂಟ್ ಹಾರ್ಮ್ so basically uh, today uh, much of the you know the fear of wild animals is actually provoked by human beings you know the environment that we have taken away from them you know, how they um, and they can only react instinctively they cannot think or rationalize so um, and here of course in the times of lord krishna uh, and then later on when he comes as chaitanya mahaprabhu the love and reciprocation uh, which is not apparent to us today I don't think we would be expecting to treat uh, tigers and lions the same way but uh, at least the least we can do is to not um, harm them or at least be sensitive to their needs so that they don't uh, they can live uh, in the way uh, they are meant to live and Uh, in almost all cases you know it is uh, they would also let human beings uh, live the way uh, we are supposed to live so it is like live and let live but this never uh, uh, because of the um, the, na- the nature of the material world this um, sense of discrimination uh, prevails in uh, ultimately only the pure devotees they have the pandita samadarshana uh, view of all living entities you know krishna and the lo- every living entity and only then they are able to uh, actually see uh, krishna uh, is the common link in all the and uh, in all the living entities but uh, till that time uh, we tend to discriminate and uh, we would like we would always see them as um, uh, superior and inferior and we see the result that everywhere we around us <clears throat> the whole world is based on discrimination whether you take it on a uh, country level or on individual level and on country levels also you, there's always the rich nations and the poor nations and they will always be fighting amongst them for because all the laws of the world have been uh, have been uh, created by the rich nations at least in this last 100 years the way the world should be governed you, whether it's united nations or the world bank or international monetary fund or any of the institutions is basically a creation of the world the uh, the rich nations to protect the their uh, strength so naturally the, the poorer nations are revolting against that within the rich nations also you have different classes you those who have been there for many generations they feel threatened by the immigrants and then you have the visa issues every country has you know there it's like fearful you know, who will get in who will uh, come in uh, uninvited and the strict laws to put them in jail recently you read that uh, uh, somebody created some visa minor infringement of fraud fraud and um, that person has been put in jail and is facing in the middle east is facing uh, a death sentence so uh, this comes about because there is always us and them even among the poorer nations and there will be caste issues you know there will be discrimination among uh, either on basis of community or caste or basis of economic strength of uh, those who the haves and the have nots 
the within the poorer nations also those who have either they have got from their own ancestors or they have by krishna's um, arrangement they have been able to make a lot of money they would like to protect it so the whole view would be to preserve and then those who don't have it they feel it is unfair and they would like to create a situation where there is equality sometimes it is by violence uh, sometimes it is by um, manipulation uh, but inevitably there will be pressure then there could be discrimination there is discrimination on age now in this selfish world people are on their own so the poor i mean the older people feel left out because more and more they are not tended to by anybody and the young uh, look at it as if as a burden they see the poor the older gen even the parents so they have old old people's homes they just park there and not only park there it is not only for their own convenience but there are there's a growing clamor for saying that uh, um because because of uh, modern medicine which prolongs life and it stretches uh, the life longer that becomes expensive and in most western countries the government pays for it therefore the in a difficult economic situation a lot of the money goes for what they call social security so younger generation it's uh, or their own parents and their own uncles and aunts their own relatives but still they will uh, they are complaining that big uh, we are, our economic uh, well being is threatened because a lot of money is going for the older people this is the kind of mentality an animalistic mentality that is there then there is discrimination between urban and rural the today in uh, typically the way the capitalist system works the economic uh, uh, might gradually comes to only relatively few people and most of them usually would be in the urban centers so naturally they will have um, all the powers of control or levers of control are generally there it's only when um, elections come then suddenly people go to the villages to canvass so this kind of thing and this is not only in india it's everywhere you know basically so there is a because the whole lifestyles are different and the rural people also uh, feel left out so in some countries like in china in the 60s when uh, mao zedong was there there was a violent overthrow uh, he had taken power the communist regime came in 1949 and in 66 there was what they called a cultural revolution what it actually meant was there was a purging uh, there something like 30 or 40 million people were killed in china alone their own people and they were forcibly pushed to go into the uh, rural communes and forced to work so it was a backlash against intellectuals so this kind of thing happens because there's always discrimination and this is the nature of the world and the discrimination comes because um, of the lack of um, understanding that <clears throat> everything belongs to krishna it's a simple formula but as prabhupada says it's simple for the simple but it was complicated for the complicated so if somebody feels that um, i don't agree with it then he will naturally canvass for support among people who will also have the same mentality so it is quite fitting in a sense that um, this chapter that we are reading uh, the killing of dhenuka dhenuka sur the ash demon actually bhaktivinoda thakur has given very nice uh, explanation on what the each individual demon represents and dhenuka sur represents gross material intelligence and complete ignorance of spiritual knowledge so by that definition we can see that actually the goal of all the leaders of society today of most civilization today as we see it is actually to become dhenukasur they will not say it but if you were to go that because using the gross material intelligence and why gross material intelligence because the real intelligence as prabhupada says is to understand the facts of life it is such, it is a fool who cannot see the reality this is a simple way if somebody says that it is raining outside and you don't look at it and you just walk as if there's a sun uh, and you uh, and you get drenched so somebody will say he's a fool he doesn't even uh, understand a simple truth but what simpler truth can there be than the fact that uh, <clears throat> the the here we have uh, i mean the there are, uh, every day every moment practically we can see the anywhere around us examples of how the lord uh, actually 
manifests himself in so many ways, he controls everything, so many things that we cannot control. But because the attitude is that we would like to be um, the controllers, so it is like uh, each one is competing to see who's the bigger dhenuka I, you know, I'm the, uh, I would like to be the you know, gold medal for being the biggest dhenuka So, um, and so it is actually a backlash of how we uh, we see the 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 world, which is the way it is going. And then you have uh, quotas, <clears throat> people perhaps well-meaning but uh, misunderstanding and then they say that they can forcibly, you know, think that you could have, uh, like in South Africa they have it in so many countries where they see that uh, some people need to be brought up to a certain level. In India also there is a tendency. They feel that it can be done but they do not understand that uh, uh, forcibly trying to change the physical external well-being and saying that, um, that this is the way, um, uh, you know, your happiness will be uh, distributed uh, is a complete uh, lack of uh, understanding because the source of happiness is not the externals. And again, there are very simple examples all around us and observations will see that those who have a lot not necessarily happy and those who don't have are not necessarily uh, unhappy. Um, so it is primarily uh, the inner consciousness, the mind, these are, um, even somebody who actually is given the, these are the basics and the beginning of spiritual knowledge. If somebody is uh, sincere enough, comes to, in contact with devotees, or reads a, a, a spiritual, uh, bona fide spiritual scripture, uh, would not take much time to understand this, that even if the difficulty in implementation may follow, that, that needs a process. But understanding this, even a child would understand it. Like Prabhupada would say that he used to quote many times and we have heard this example that uh, when there was a large attendance of many uh, so-called sannyasis and all and Prabhupada asked them who is the Supreme Personality of God and people were giving all kinds of uh, complicated answers and then he turned to this little girl Saraswati, the first child born into the ISKCON movement and she was only four years old and she just said uh, uh, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of God very simple, that we don't need to have a complicated answer. So, uh, that Prabhupada said, see, she knows, she understands what uh, uh, the, uh, the real answer is. So basically, actually the truth is simple to understand, but um, the process to follow it is not so simple, but naturally something valuable uh, cannot be just, uh, it, it, it cannot be so cheap that anyone can take it, and because that is again our tendency to so take it. So therefore, we have to prove our desire and that desire comes, uh, we can show by determination, by choices that we make, by avoiding various uh, temptations, by sticking to the path, you know, accepting certain austerity of uh, both physical and mental. Um, so these are only tests that are given to us in, um, in to make a choice and these are given to the human beings. So that is what, uh, so in a very basic form, the religious life, uh, there are two forms of religious life. Either there is a pravritti mark or the nivritti mark. So pravritti mark are those where uh, the um, worshipping demigods or even the supreme percent of Godhead is basically for improving the material condition of life. Nivritti mark would be where um, there is a sense of renunciation and on the path, the process of <clears throat> self-control and ultimately leading to accept, uh, trying to live a life of, of putting Krishna in the center in, of everything that we do. So, uh, the, these are the two choices that everyone has. Either they follow one um, or the other, wh whether they understand it or they don't. And uh, uh, even, if it, uh, even if we mentally understand it, the path of accepting it and following it, uh, the temptations are so many even for a spiritualist, even for a transcendentalist, because uh, that's why Krishna warns Arjuna that don't get uh, carried away by the flowery words of the Vedas. The description of the heavenly planets is so beautiful that uh, we would be tempted to accept that. And that is why we follow authority, a bona fide guru, who tell us as to what we need to avoid 
what we need to um, even what may be um, ultimately these are all satric people people who are uh, followers of um, lord krishna but nevertheless not accepting the heavenly planets because um, of the tendency to uh, develop our own uh, desires for material sense gratification because it then dovetails thinking that i can just continue i accept krishna and if i continue uh, in the same way uh, then at least i'll be assured a better uh, form of life and okay i'll live longer i'll be happier so that is also a great danger so that is why that is also a worry while in the vaikuntha planets uh, where uh, which is uh, and golok being the topmost but the problem is not problem but the challenge is that uh, or the the catch is that in the vaikuntha planets we cannot go there until we have even the slightest tinge of material desire and that is where the uh, somehow not accepting any uh, profit adoration or any prestige uh, we have to keep working on it and these are the challenges that may come even to somebody who's uh, following trying to follow a spiritual path let alone someone who is not interested in it at all but we see we have examples of uh, how people have transcended uh, have been uh, from the most difficult modes for instance in the 11th canto we have the story of the avanti brahman who uh, actually was uh, uh, you know uh, everybody had abandoned him though he had uh, at one time he had money and but because of his nature and his uh, miserliness he was uh, abandoned by everyone uh, his family and it came to a stage where he had nothing uh, you know he was robbed of everything his uh, family were uh, every single person left him he was practically uh, completely alone and with nothing but in that stage the realization came that um, actually i don't want anything i only want you krishna so uh, even from the most uh, the depths of most difficult situation the avanti brahman came to the realization that all the problems are in the mind how i perceive how we perceive things is how we uh, consider uh, that he is my friend he is my enemy that this is my uh, happiness this is my uh, unhappiness uh, he is um, my friend he is not my friend so uh, uh, it the perception and the consciousness has to change the other example is uh, of uh, um king pururava in the uh, in the bhagavatam shivan bhagavatam ninth canto <clears throat> there is a wonderful story about king pururava who was actually not only a great king but he came from a dynasty of uh, of other great kings who were actually very close to god and but because of his uh, infatuation to urvashi who was uh, a very beautiful damsel in the heavenly planets uh, who was with indra at that time so he went to the extreme levels of uh, trying to win her over he did everything that he could uh, anyone beyond anything anyone can imagine um, dedicating his own thinking how to acquire her how to get her and um, he was a king uh, therefore he had all the resources and finally he actually managed to get her and uh, <clears throat> but uh, while he was with her and then uh, just by some accidental and he did everything to please her he did uh, more than one would expect he dedicated all his uh, resources and life to keep her happy but by some accident accidentally he disturbed her because it seems she had told him that uh, she was very fond of her lambs which she had brought with her and she didn't uh, she had said that this is one condition you have to protect them at all times and also that she would he, he should never uh, appear without clothes to her so indra was trying to win urvashi away from him and therefore he conspired to get those lambs take away the lambs from him so from her <clears throat> and so when that happened and then when she started uh, urvashi was you know shouting at him that what have you been doing where are my lambs so he actually Uh, you know did as he was wanting to he did all he could he went after them and he somehow he got the lambs back but then he brought them to her and then he was actually without clothes because he was resting and he just ran off so then she got she left him so at that stage something like the avanti brahman stage that he had 
uh, he had everything and then the next moment he had nothing because uh, though he still had the wealth and everything, but for him the most important possession was this beautiful lady. And uh, even though he had everything but her, for his mind was focused only on that one object which he didn't have. This is also a lesson for us because this is typical that sometimes we may be getting, we may be desiring for things and we may be um, in anguish because we have various problems and then we find that actually things turn out to be much better, suddenly the problems are uh, solved. Uh, it happens uh, so many times. But still, the one problem remains and then that problem consumes all our thinking. And this is actually the state of uh, situation elsewhere. So when we look at somebody and say that this person must be so happy, he's got everything, but we cannot understand the uh, state of mind. So somebody who may have uh, acquired unbelievable riches, but if we see someone more rich, then that becomes a consuming thought for him, that how he can go more. So similarly here, in the case of uh, <clears throat> Pururava, that became his... Uh, his uh, uh, burning, uh, you know, his heart was burning for that. So he did everything, could even all over the world looking for her and uh, that became his focus. Finally he found her and uh, she actually preached to him very nicely that, you know, this is, uh, you are a fool, I mean, why do you have to abandon everything, come for me? And um, uh, she actually gives him very wise uh, counsel that, uh, you know, ultimately this is a material body and so on. But he heard all this, but still King Pururava's desire was that, no, I, I want you back. And he did many major yagyas and talked um, to Vishnu and finally he got her back. And it is said that then he, they stayed together for some time and he tried to enjoy life as it is. But eventually he was uh, so frustrated that uh, even though he had what he wanted, one would say that that is the, like we see in the movies, the happy ending. You know, he desired everything, he got it and that's it. But now comes the catch. Well, actually, there's a whole chapter in which he says, uh, he, uh, after, uh, after many, uh, a long period that he stayed with her, and he was so frustrated, even though he had everything he could. And then he talks about uh, the futility of the material body and how the frustration and, uh, develops when you uh, uh, go after sense objects. So it came out of deep realization. So we can understand that people who ha are, have great thinking, great wisdom and have made mistakes and have learned from their own mistakes, we can see that how they understand life uh, and, the, and the realities. <clears throat> but today the difficulty for us is that the entire world is actually dedicating the whole life in pursuing just what we are told to avoid. Because uh, every single-minded pursuit is trying to see how um, we can eradicate misery and death. Simply put, it is that, that how do we eradicate uh, misery and death, which a sensible person, uh, even somebody who uh, can um, uh, op uh, listen with, a, with an open mind, with an uh, objective uh, approach, would not take long to understand that it is impossible. It is, you don't need law, uh, you don't need deep uh, spiritual understanding. This makes logical sense that uh, there are so many things, most things are out of our control. Most important being that we cannot stop ourselves from growing old, getting disease and we are going to die. These are basic and nobody wants to do that. This doesn't need rocket science to understand. But nevertheless, the whole world is completely uh, moved towards that and not only that, the powers that be, the levers of uh, the institutions, you know, the, everything is designed, uh, the science, the technology, everything is to the entertainment, everything is designed to see how they can counter this, that how they can find ways to cover misery. So basically the attitude of uh, 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 people in the world would be to not to accept reality. And a spiritualist or a devotee, a sincere devotee would at least um, be able to, willing to discuss this openly. Sometimes people say that why you talk about death all the time, why you talk about these things. I mean, I, I um, have this experience that when you talk to people, sometimes, you know, just in casual conversation, uh, when we, it, uh, it comes up uh, that 
you know, yeah, we uh, ultimately so, you know, we'll have to die after this. And, you know, it creates such a shock that even the word death, you know, it's like, how can you speak like this? And, and suddenly they react uh, as if it never existed. But <clears throat> to have a normal conversation, to accept that these are the realities, is very difficult for people to accept. So how can you expect them to open their minds and to really try to see what, is, what are the real problems and uh, is there a solution and what are the solutions? If Krishna is uh, the controller and if he is, um, and still there is misery and death to the human being, so there must be something wrong because that is, this, can, this is not the um, end of life as, uh, as it should be because if Krishna is considered, is all merciful. But this kind of understanding cannot come because of the overriding um, deep um, desire to find a solution to, in their own way and using all the resources to see how they can find uh, uh, happiness uh, in their own way. I mean, people can, uh, the, the best of the scientists, uh, best in the sense the academically inclined scientists of the world, they have spent, you know, ten billion dollars to create some kind of a machine which they claim will, you know, chemically produce life. Now, there is no proof of it, but they have spent uh, probably two decades and spent ten billion dollars to just create one equipment. Oh, uh, it is quite uh, strange, but it is a fact that this is the way. So therefore, why, uh, for us to understand that this is what we, uh, what a sincere devotee would be up against, and uh, if we anticipate that, then uh, rather than sitting in judgment, we can just consider how fortunate we are. It's not that we, we, we have no understanding how we came into this association. We didn't have a deep desire. So we would take things around us more seriously, appreciate the, the, uh, that how Krishna has arranged situations such a way that we have wisdom around us, we have people, uh, great examples around us, people who are sincerely striving and also who have spent, some of them, you know, have really we can see the transformations that take place around us. So actually it's a question of, uh, as Prabhupada put in a very nice analogy, the crows and the swans. Because he said that the swans will always go to the lakes, very beautiful lakes. The swan will go towards the beautiful lotus flowers there, will actually take the nectar from the stem. But the crow, uh, that, that is, they will never go there. They will go where the garbage is there, where the refuse is there. That is the way they, uh, that's where they find the, the happiness, their uh, juice, their taste. So uh, it is for us to decide where we would like to be. Uh, whether we want to be with the crows or with the swans. And Prabhupada went on to explain that the, when he used this analogy, he mentioned that uh, the crows, the, there were the old crows and the new crows, because the old crows are the ones who uh, have only been born into sense gratification. And he meant the, the people in the West, because when he, st when he was preaching there, at that time, it was, there was a vast distinction because the lifestyle and the um, whole the world around the Western uh, civilization was, uh, which is even more so now, but where people were, um, they had no other thought other than sense gratification. Uh, they were born into that and so they were actually generation after generation after generation uh, only in one single track uh, and that was not giving happiness. So actually, but they didn't have any other, th they, they didn't know what else to do. So it was not as if they were excited about it. They were tired of it, but they had no choice. So they were what Prabhupada called the old crows. Now they have nothing else to do and uh, they don't know anything better. But when he talked that time, there was a, uh, the uh, Indians, that was just beginning how the, uh, of the time when the Indians used to go to the West and um, settle there for making material progress. And Prabhupada referred to the Indians as the new crows. What he meant is that uh, they have gone there chasing after the garbage because they are abandoning the, not only the wisdom but also the source of happiness which is around here, but actually going after uh, the, what is actually um, uh, not going to produce a, 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 any happiness but in fact going to entangle them even more. But it became, it, uh, and then of course after the uh, 90s when India's economic policy changed and the liberalization, so-called liberalization took place, it, it was only one way of bringing the Western culture here. 
So then, um, if that is what we now refer to is that uh, now the whole country has become, uh, the India, country of India has become a uh, country of uh, crows. So basically, uh, the distinction between a cultured civilization and uh, a lack of culture would be, is really judged by how uh, an environment is created where um, the good in us, everybody has the good in them where which uh, wants to, uh, to surrender, to, uh, to be truthful, to follow a sattvic path how that environment can be promoted. So a civilization which can create that kind of culture where people can actually promote their goodness and, uh, and uh, in the association of other people like that, bring that uh, out, uh, that is actually really cultured civilization. While well, any civilization which actually promotes animal propensities and which actually brings the worst in us, you know, our tendencies to get... Uh, angry, stressed, um, uh, you know, proud, greedy, and uh, as individuals, and then as collectively as communities and as nations, if we move towards it, towards uh, all tendencies, uh, then that actually takes us away from it. So actually, uh, a culture civilization would outlaw many of the things that are going on today, but that is uh, not something which... Uh, is going to happen. So therefore, Prabhupada created ISKCON, which is um, a life which is uh, actually is a world where we have the opportunity to create a life uh, on our, uh, which is a world within a world, a spiritual world, which is uh, 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 an opportunity for devotees to take shelter of uh, a lifestyle which can, you know, which can bring them out of the, uh, the tenden all the animal propensities and tendencies. So Prabhupada also talks about um, he, right through you know in many of his purports in the in Bhagavatam uh, he constantly talks about that how if we do not have Krishna as the center of our life um, and Krishna as the goal of our life then uh, very likely we'll be looking at having other uh, role models. So everybody desires to have an idol, somebody who will be worshipped, and we this is a uh, some of our, a very simple thing to understand that uh, how a misplaced idol around us where people are constantly going after the say the entertainers or the um, superstars in sports or maybe in business or in uh, politics or even in uh, so called social uh, philanthropy <clears throat> they will create a role model where they want to actually live a life of uh, happiness they want the bliss, they want the happiness that is associated with, uh, with spiritual life, but they don't want Krishna. So in that, if they see somebody who they think represents that in their minds, who's successful, who's materially successful, who uh, has influence, power, and who's created such a an, uh, kind of uh, image, and people completely uh, follow that, and then of course they're quick to abandon that also eventually. So that's where the frustration becomes even more. So they are lurching from one to the other. And uh, Prabhupada repeatedly said, actually when he went to the West, it was a stage where he, we know that the cultural revolution that was taking place was primarily rejecting all the authority because they did not trust anybody. So they found trust in Prabhupada. Many of the thousands of people did. And by that, that's how they came closer to uh, to, uh, to Vaishnavism. And that's really what the challenge, uh, what uh, the greatness of uh, Prabhupada was. So, um, I just wanted to, um, I was recently reading in um, a book on George Harrison, and I wanted to just uh, bring this part out because um, this book written by uh, Yogeshwar Prabhu, who's a devotee, also a very good writer in his own um, occupation. Um, actually brings out because George Harrison was right up there in the among the most famous uh, personalities of the last century and through him and through the people associated with uh, the Beatles the band group which was very famous you get just a glimpse of uh, what kind of uh, life 
not only what kind of life, but actually uh, uh, how miserable they can be in spite of the situation they were in. So, you know, when this so-called, uh, this was in the period of 1962 to 69, that was that seven, eight, nine year period, uh, you know, the symptoms of that, I mean, uh, just uh, was that whenever they had, uh, when they started becoming successful, tens of thousands of fans used to park themselves all night long outside the box offices, hoping to secure tickets. When they had programs, the uh, police would have to move around with dogs on leases, right? because the, the, the fans, the people who were uh, their, their so-called fans, I mean, they went so crazy, people couldn't understand what was the reason, but they became, they were so crazy about the Beatles that, you know, they would actually break the barricades, climb on stage, clamber all over them. It was actually a frightening experience for them. When they would land in airports, the, and not only the airport would be choked, but even the, like when they came to London after they returned from US, the entire city was completely uh, in, at a standstill. Uh, you know, they, and sometimes in the concerts, um, these hoses to, were turned on by the police just to keep away the screaming fans. Uh, young girls by the thousands would write to them about their fantasies. The talk about renunciation, but this is how challenging it would be for young 20-year-olds who are not, uh, you know, just fresh out of their youth. When they went on the first trip to the U.S., <clears throat> they were, it was as if, uh, uh, how you track an enemy bomber, you know, a, a plane which is coming, you know, in war, uh, everybody so uh, minutely observing. They were actually, the radios across the U.S. They were tracking the approach of their flight saying that you know, the Beatles have left 30 minutes ago, now they're flying over the Atlantic, now they're landing, now this is 32 degrees, uh, Beatle degrees. Then when the plane landed, uh, they said that the noise from the huge crowd was, it was so loud that it overtook the roar of the jet engines. And it was routine for them to have the police on motorcycles flanked, you know, by sirens blaring that we see in India often, lights spinning, but in the West it is not common. They gave their first TV show, and there were a capacity of 728 in the studio, and 50,000 fans wanted to jam there. Uh, and that show, the first show, uh, one third of the U.S., 73 million people watched that. Now, when they were told that, they were so frightened, because it's one thing to want, uh, up to a point, you know, um, you can, uh, we cannot see the distinction, but actually for them, I mean, they, initially they tasted the success, but later on they were frightened out of the wits. They didn't know what they were getting into. And on George Harrison's 21st birthday, nearly one million cards, letters, and gifts arrived. There were seven truckloads of mail that filled the entry of their home for several weeks. The postal department said that that was the most mail delivered to any one address in the history of UK outside the royal family. You know, girls would come and kiss the doorknobs you know, of their uh, parents' homes and you know, they were constantly barraging outside. They couldn't even move out. When they went to Adelaide, for instance, in uh, 300,000, half the population of the city came out to see them. And uh, <clears throat> so now see how the mentality was. When George was asked, he said that we were really, we felt like, not only really, we, we, we felt like we were monkeys in a zoo, <laughs> completely trapped. And it was not like a, it was, it was joking, he was, basically the whole world had become claustrophobic. They were either in the confines of the hotels, then they would go on to the cars, they'd go on the stages, they'd go on the recording booths, that's it. The circle was only hotels, cars, stage, stage and, and recording booth. They had no privacy, they were, um, and this was for seven, eight years, and this was one of the reasons also they broke up. There was so much of uh, uh, stress in their lives. You know, once George Harrison got so upset that, he threw a glass of orange juice at his press secretary because he didn't want to meet some people and uh, celebrities and actors and top politicians would insist on meeting them. And, you know, and then they got into a fight. So this was routine that uh, they, would, uh, they were in, under enormous stress. Now this is behind closed doors. Externally everyone was looking at how famous they were. Um, just to visit, they could, it was unthinkable to even step out of their house. But once in a blue moon when they wanted to visit a friend, uh, he would have to at least change three cabs 
just to keep the press away or the fans away. So it, it, was, it was like every public movement outside their home was, uh, had to be like a military maneuver. It had to be planned in advance. Can you imagine living a day-to-day -day life like that? So if you see the fame, this is the other side of it. And why? Because people were so desperate, you know, to kind of uh, find an escapism for, you know, um, they were so unhappy that when they found temporarily, you know, then suddenly everything was, uh, they were putting all their faith in them. Even though George was married, it was quite often that young girls would sneak into, and they had security guards, and they'd sneak into their room and sometimes they were under their beds. I mean, he's with his wife and they'd suddenly find two, these girls and the... Uh, <laughs> So this is what he did. he was when he mentioned this. This is the, the hysteria that was most terrifying to them. And his sister gave a very graphic example. When she said, "Louise, he was very close to her," and she said that once when they were in Chicago, she remembered that he, they were all in a hotel and they had to go to a program. So the police had to take them out of the window. So they had to actually climb out of the window. Then they got onto the fire exit and going down. So she remembers uh, one instance, she said when he came out and he turned to look at her because she was quite close. So uh, she said, I will never forget that, you know, it was like I saw in his eyes, uh, what he said, it was like the eyes of a deer uh, looking into the barrel of a gun. That was the fear and fright that he had. The eyes of a deer looking, you know, if, if, you, if you turn on, the, if you put a gun and you're about to, be, uh, to shoot a deer, it's so frightened. That was the fear that he had. Uh, so basically, uh, George, uh, because of his uh, understanding, this was before he met Prabhupada, but he, he could understand, but then when he was interviewed, it was after Srila Prabhupada had left this world. So he said that this is the exaggerated expectations from worshippers. And the people had assumed that somebody who was successful, he had acquired special powers. So it was routine. One of the frustrating things for them was that disabled children. It is not just in India, this is in the West. The disabled children, people who, children who had no arms or legs, children who were blind, children who were uh, deaf, dumb, parents and caregivers would bring them as if these, just to touch them so that they thought that they had healing powers. And a person like George who was very sensitive and he knew his own limitations. And he, he, he says in the book and he says that, you know, we are ordinary people. You know, we, we were not even very good looking, we were, we, had, we were learning our singing, we were not that good. But it was just uh, the kind of craze which, uh, uh, you know, which was actually very depressing for them. So, we are talking about how, um, uh, how people idolize, if they don't have Krishna, they can completely change and uh, put it into, a, uh, in, into, repose it into something which um, from both sides. Here we saw from the, uh, from the inside view of people who are receiving it and how frustrating it was for them, how terrifying it was. I mean, it actually it's frightening for them. But on the other hand, even from the people who repose the faith, and perhaps many of us may have done that in the past, you know, in our childhood or in our youth, as we are growing up, and we find that it is uh, so ridiculous that uh, ultimately they are, uh, we are all uh, human beings, ordinary human beings, but to scale them up. So actually this is the way the world has been created, that it is actually, it is necessary. And then people market it because uh, there is a, a huge profit out of that for a lot of people. So it's a whole industry how to promote people. There's one, I just end this particular episode on one last thing that uh, they, at that time, um, George Harrison's, uh, the Beatles, uh, were the first to actually start the, uh, occupying the stadiums. See, till that time they would give concerts, but um, nobody had the, the thought that people can actually fill up a whole stadium. Now, stadiums would have 60, 70,000 people. And uh, 50 years ago, it was, you know, people, 5, 10,000 was considered huge. So when they went to, uh, and, and the, typically this was uh, happening regularly. So how they would come, that they would be flown in a helicopter, they would land in a nearby mountain top or somewhere and then they would be put in an armored truck and then they would be taken you know so initially the first time second time perhaps you know it's like you, you are uh, you feel that special that this is amazing how you, but uh, regularly it was like as if they were prisoners 
you know, they were taken in, uh, shepherded in an Ahmad truck. And then when the Ahmad, uh, this was one particular incident which uh, Yogeshwar Prabhu describes in uh, New York, one stadium, uh, and which he said was typical that when they happened, when um, they went there and it was so, as soon as they arrived, the hysteria and the noise was so deafening, so loud, that the 2,000 police who were there, I mean, they were holding their pain at their ears uh, in, in agony. They couldn't bear the, 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 the kind of volume that shrieking and screaming. But the, the funny part was that when actually the, the singing began, he, he described to Yogeshwar Prabhu, he said that none of us could even hear ourselves. So Ringo Starr, who was the drummer, there were four of them. So the drummer was Ringo Starr. He couldn't even hear what he was playing. So he was only looking at the other three's feet to, know, to keep tune. So how his, their legs would move when they were playing the guitar and how their backsides would move. Then that, that's how he was playing the, to get the rhythm because he couldn't hear the song. And none of the, uh, they were joint vocalists, they couldn't even hear each other. So they were just looking at the lips, uh, lip synchronization to try to pick up the words. So it was, so next day George Harrison was interviewed and he was asked, uh, so how was it? He said, uh, it was so sad that the worst part was that I have stopped caring about, uh, he publicly said, I have stopped caring about uh, how I'm singing in, in this concert. And that was the end of the concert. After that, the Beatles stopped giving concert because they saw so the last three years that they were together, it was uh, not only the pressure, but also um, that there was no joy even in the singing. So coming back to the uh, question about finding substitutes for Krishna, it is an impossibility. So even the, uh, uh, to, to try to find, because all these are in a sense substitutes that people would see, somewhere they want to repose the faith. There is a strong desire to repose that, but if it's not put in a worthy person, then it ends in great frustration. And then there's bitterness, there is also uh, disillusionment, and uh, eventually people walk away. Only uh, uh, some will then uh, maybe turn to Krishna consciousness. So, uh, Prabhupada also mentioned that India actually, uh, notwithstanding what is happening now, but eventually the, the soul of India is still a land of culture. Because you can see in so many ways, just now the Kumbh Mela is going on. Um, I mean, the, how many? Tens of millions of people. And um, you never, and this is happening, this has happened several times in the last 40, 50 years, that uh, it's the largest congregation of people in one place. And yet you never find any, uh, any kind of uh, bickering, fighting. People live, you know, there are apparently 10,000 different uh, faiths that come there. So, uh, eventually there is tolerance and there is a, a harmony in, uh, in one particular area where, where people can actually come and stay for almost a month without, in a peaceful existence. So it is, uh, but this is never highlighted because it is considered very uh, strange. But recently, just last week I read that the Harvard uh, University has actually commissioned and they sent, they are preparing a case study on this, so they have sent a large team to actually, the, so they are presently right there, they are studying all the, not only the systems, but also interviewing a lot of people to try to understand how this uh, strange phenomena can happen. So it is ultimately because there's a, still there's a tolerance within Indians, you know, that they can accept this uh, situation. Also the uh, acceptance of the laws of karma, the Indians, generally most Indians would accept that without even questioning. I mean, they just understand that. Even the poorest people have an understanding that there is fate and then how they act will uh, decide their future. So there is a certain restraint because of that. And uh, also Prabhupada mentioned that uh, only in India uh, I am receiving uh, people, uh, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 people crowds. It was unheard of. Anywhere outside India, if we could get two, three hundred people, it was like a huge crowd. Uh, so this was a pointer to ultimately that Indians at least had, and they still have. It is decreasing, but uh, there is a certain sense uh, and acceptance. It's only that there is a coverage of, uh, because of uh, a lack of precise spiritual knowledge, and therefore they can be taken wayward. But uh, Prabhupada also warned that Maya's agents are actually uh, out to see that India is destroyed. And that's, that is the, but Krishna is in control. 
But why? Because if India's uh, culture is finished, the world is finished. Because if you see, uh, the only hope the world has is primarily uh, to India. And uh, if you look at that uh, from that situation, um, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's advent has been timed to see that uh, in this age, not only the simplest process has been given, of all the various processes of all the avatars in all the various uh, millenniums in the past, uh, is it a coincidence that it has come in the worst of times? No, in the worst of times, Krishna has given the easiest process and um, it is, uh, is simple to understand, not so simple to follow, but again, if it is done in the association, in the loving uh, environment of um, sincere, uh, like-minded people, then again it becomes very simple. So the uh, the understanding is simple, but then uh, if we do not want, if we do not practice it, and the effort and the determination to uh, change our uh, thinking, to bring ourselves only to uh, the same environment that is uh, um, that we need to, because that means lifestyle changes, that means so many choices we have to make, and those are the ones where we are tested. But once having done that, then we don't have to think. You just follow the process, you know, we, everything is there. I mean, just, uh, so if we are just uh, putting our, uh, our faith, our loyalty, our, you know, our love in um, our friendship, everything in, in an environment which is trusted, which is uh, our mind and intelligence has already told us that this is to accept, then, not, then beyond that, we just have to hang on to the coattails and we will be taken up. But then hanging on means that uh, we don't abandon it under at any circumstances. You know, if we suddenly find um, some, uh, you know, something unpleasant happening with some devotee, or we find something very, um, uh, very, very uh, profitable or something very attractive in the outside world, something which changes uh, our uh, material fortune, those kind of various temptations may come. At those other times we need to, uh, if we are able to overcome that, then all other limitations would be taken care of just by following um, the the path that Srila Prabhupada has given. And that is where we say that the greatness of Srila Prabhupada, that um, he had the vision to create uh, in the parampara of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, situation where not, uh, given us the process also, he has brought down the 64 rounds of chanting to 16 rounds. And... Um, just basically uh, avoiding the four uh, pillars of uh, sin, sinful activities, and uh, associating with devotees. Uh, these are the only basic requirements that Prabhupada has put. So, and he has given us a way where we can actually uh, combine our external occupational needs with the internal consciousness, uh, which is uh, which needs to guide the uh, uh, our external life. So, we end here. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, are there any questions or any comments? So, Granthraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai.